All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are, everybody. My name is Cyrus Jansen. I'm going to welcome you to today's stream. And it's been a while since we've done a live stream. I wanted to come back and essentially just share some thoughts on a lot of things that are developing in China right now. Um, this is really important timing because let me just uh, go ahead and mute my computer here. And there we go. So, you know, there's a lot of important things that are happening in China right now. And I wanted to have a live stream talking about a breaking story that is Nancy Pelosi uh, is potentially going to be visiting Taiwan in August. Uh, I wanted to share some some kind of the information that I've been hearing from both China and the United States on this issue. And then also what the original topic of the stream is going to be is uh, this mortgage crisis, the bank crisis that we're seeing in China right now. Um, I've also been able to find some really interesting research that is quite amazing and really kind of gives a better perspective for all of us to understand uh, this very complicated thing that we're have that's happening right now. Um, all right. Um, let's just make sure we are good to go. So first of all, how's everybody in the stream? Can we everybody hear me good? As you can see, I am... Um, I'm in a different location today. I'm currently on a business trip. Um, I've had a lot of things going on in my personal life right now. So I'm just kind of really busy at the moment. And um, actually, as many of you know, I normally debut a video every Saturday here on the YouTube channel. And I'm kind of in a restructuring phase right now. I'm trying to get things organized. And what we're going to see moving forward is I definitely want to be a little bit more consistent on YouTube. And I want to do more live streams. So I'm kind of getting things set up right now. Uh, where we're going to be able to have a little bit more of a consistent schedule, going to be doing more live streams. I've got some really exciting announcements on that uh, coming up. And also, you know, just more regular content for everybody to enjoy. As you know, there's always something to talk about when it is, uh, you know, talking about China and, you know, the world and how we live. So let me just, uh, let's jump in right into it. So as always, I'm going to be checking the uh, comment section here and making sure that everybody, uh, if you have any questions, you know, let me know down below. And we're going to go ahead and start off with, um, let's talk about, um, I want to talk about this bank crisis, because this is something that a lot of people are worried about right now. Uh, they're very much worried about, uh, for example, we've seen uh, there's been many bank runs in this rural part of Henan province. Uh, many people are worried about the financial stability of China. The interesting thing is, is why this is so important is because China plays such a such a big role in our global economy. And I think, you know, this has really been evident these last six months, especially when we see, you know, the sanctions against Russia and we see how that has actually, uh, you know, impacted the entire global supply chain. Um, you know, I was talking to my father yesterday and he's a general contractor in Florida. And he said, look at all of our prices for, for you know, lumber. Uh, you know, wiring, you know, the, the metal wires that you need to wire a house, those have gone up 100% in the last three months. So for him, his business is so difficult because he's building houses and so much of these materials are coming from around the world and the prices are just so unstable. You know, lumber, materials, concrete, all of these things have shot up. Of course, we see inflation. Inflation is over 9% in the United States. It's up everywhere around the world. And this has really, you know, just been a, a very big um, reflection of the global economy that we live in. So if China has is having some banking stress and there's some significant stress in the financial system in China, you know, that is going to impact the rest of the world as well. You know, so very, very similar to what we saw in 2008 and 2009 with the global financial recession. Uh, that was obviously caused by fraud and by, uh, you know, just a complete mortgage meltdown in the United States. Well, that triggered an entire worldwide recession. And, you know, we're, we're kind of moving towards that right now uh, with this worldwide recession. So it's kind of a dire time right now. Uh, and it's not just China, right? It's, it's the United States, it's Canada, it's, you know, many, many major economies around the world are struggling right now with inflation, and we're seeing the fallout of this war. So, uh, you know, we just want to, uh, want to address that important issue here. Um, also, I want to, uh, First of all, I want to say thanks to Alex from Reporterify Media. I know he's here in the comment section as well. Uh, he's one of my admins on the channel, uh, kind of helping moderate the, the chat there. So, Alex, thanks for taking time out of your day to help be here. And uh, we're going to answer any super chats that come in. So if you have any super chats, uh, make, I'll make sure to answer those. So uh, what do you think about the Western BS about tanks and protests at the banks? Uh, that's from Trevor Norman. 
um, yeah, you know, I'm going to talk about that. And let me let me share with you some of the research that I was able to do. And I'm going to pull up an article that I was able to find. And, and this is this is really an, this is going to be very important for you guys to understand, you know, why it's important to read Western and Chinese media sites. So I'm just going to show you, for example, this is what Bloomberg reported. Why are people across China refusing to pay their mortgages? What to know so far? Now, this is the headline article from Bloomberg. And I want to show you what the Western media is reporting first. So let's let's just have a look at what Bloomberg's reporting just to get a perspective of what they're you know, reporting on here. Um, now, it says home buyers have stopped mortgage payments on at least 100 projects in more than 50 cities as of Wednesday, according to researcher China Real Estate Information Corporation. That's up from 58 projects on Tuesday and only 28 on Monday, according to Jeffrey's Financial Group Incorporated analysis, including uh, Xu Jinchen. Now, the names on this list have doubled every day in the past day, three days, Chen wrote in a note published on Thursday. The incident would dampen buyer sentiment, especially for pre-sold products offered by private developers, given the higher risk on delivery and weigh on the gradual sales recovery. Uh, the delayed projects make up about 1% of China's, China's total mortgage balance, according to Jeffries. Should every buyer default, that would lead to a 388 billion yuan, that's about $58 billion uh, USD, increase in non-performing loans. So, um, I mean, this is what Bloomberg's reporting. And I'm not going to say that this is wrong or, you know, that this is very factual. I mean, these are just, these are, they're, they're, they're contacting, uh, you know, Chinese research groups and analysis groups in China. They're getting real information. And, and let's be honest, you know, there's, there is some things that have gone wrong in China and there's, you know, this, this situation uh, is not ideal, but let's go ahead and show you a little bit more research into what these numbers really mean. That's the key thing. Because the problem is, is when we read something like that from Bloomberg, we only have kind of, we only scratch the surface. We really don't know all of the details involved in that. You read that article, you're thinking, wow, this is a disaster. You know, China's going to break down. This is, you know, how bad is it in China? This could be a huge nationwide problem. Well, I was able to find this research, and this is from a research group um, called Plenum China. Uh, so it's called Plenum China. They're an independent research group, uh, investment group in China. They're on the ground and they have a little bit different perspective on this. And let's go ahead and read this one to you. And it said, uh, the direct impact on banks is actually much smaller. Uh, total outstanding bank loans are renminbi 212 trillion and mortgage loans account for 18% of total loans at renminbi 39 trillion. Now we estimate that the number of people with a mortgage is likely in the range of 40 to 100 million. Now, the 100 residential projects facing repayment boycotts probably represent about 100,000 households. Now, that's just something that's really important to understand is the numbers in China. Uh, as we know, China is the most populous country in the world. There's 1.4 billion people in China. And there's also some interesting things uh, when, we, when we look at, you know, how China structures its real estate. I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of that, but I'm going to just add a little bit of context here. Um, for example, I, I bought an apartment in Shanghai and I was able to get a mortgage in China. Now, typically the bare minimum for a down payment would be 30% in China. Uh, that would be kind of standard. Now, I think as a foreigner, I think I actually had to put down a little bit more. I can't remember exactly what it was. I bought it a long time ago. I think it was 2009 I bought the apartment. Um, but it, I believe I put down maybe 35 or even 40% down. They required a higher threshold for me as a foreigner but I know minimum really is about 30%. So, you know, that's very different because in the West, and this is exactly what we saw in 2009 with the with this mortgage meltdown that was happening in America, you could put zero money down and buy a house. And there were some very, very, um, you know, very, very uh, difficult places in the United States that, that had so much risk. Uh, one of the biggest ones was my home state of Florida, and again, my father, who's a general contractor, he kind of saw the writing on the wall because, you know, in Florida at that time, uh, he had a phone call from a customer and she had called him and said, hey, can you come and remodel my house? He went over to the house. It was a $500,000 house. And my father was like, oh, this is interesting. You know, um, you know, I'm just curious, like, what do you do for a living? You know, it's a beautiful house. And she said, oh, I work as a nail technician doing nails. This is my third house that I bought. And he's kind of looking like, excuse me, your third house that you've bought. 
And she's, she's like, yeah, I'm just, you know, all these houses are going up. We're just going to buy them and, you know, they're going to go up. We're going to sell them. And we're basically buying them with zero money down, you know, very low interest rates or flexible, uh, adjustable rate mortgages. And, and, you know, that was the writing on the wall. I mean, this wasn't going to be sustainable. And of course we saw what happened is so many people got caught with these adjustable rate mortgages where they got them very low. All of a sudden the mortgage payments went up. They couldn't make the payments, the whole thing bankrupt. All, everybody lost these houses. A lot of people went into bankruptcy. So it's a bit different scenario when we're looking at, uh, you know, it, typically in the West, you can put a lot smaller amount of money down. Uh, and that was, of course, back in the day. It's tightened up now because of this, um, you know, because of this disaster that happened in 2009. But let's go ahead and go back to, um, you know, this this insight from Plenum China, which is, again, this in, in, this this research firm in China. And it's going to show you exactly how dire this is. It says the 100 residential projects facing repayments probably represent around 100,000 households. Now, this is a tiny portion of the total number of people with mortgages and their outstanding mortgage loans are probably no more than 100 billion RMB, representing, representing a tiny share of the total nationwide mortgage amount. Now, even if the number of boycotters grows by 10 times, the impact on the banking system would still be limited. Now, that's a really important thing to understand is, is again, we have to look at China and the scale of the numbers because all of a sudden you're thinking 100,000 households might be affected by this potential you know, bank and mortgage crisis. Now, and if Bloomberg is analyzing this and Western media is analyzing this, 100,000 households sounds like a lot. Um, and, and it is, it is, it is a lot of people still being affected, but on the grand scale of China in the real estate market, uh, this is really a very tiny portion. Even this research firm said, you know what, let's go ahead and forecast that this is going to grow by 10 times a factor of 10. If it increases by 10 times, you know, it's still going to have a very minimum effect on the Chinese banking system. So I think this is some really good context to kind of understand. And again, it's the numbers that are so important here. So you know, even if that number of boycotters grows by 10 times, the impact on the banking system would still be limited. Most Chinese home buyers need to pay a deposit of at least 30% when they take out a mortgage, which gives the banks a decent buffer. And again, this is a really good point right here. And what I mentioned earlier in the stream, you know, you have stricter mortgage requirements, right? And this is, this is also kind of a cultural thing as well. Uh, typically Chinese, they don't like to put on a lot of debt. They don't like to take on a lot of debt. Um, I mean, the average American household lives in debt. Uh, the average American citizen has, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of debt, whether it's student loans, um, you know, home loans, it could be medical loans. It could be, um, you know, college loans. I mean, there's many, many Americans. Uh, by far, the average American lives in a tremendous amount of debt. So it's it, culturally, it's very easy for Americans or Westerners to accept debt and to take on more riskier investments. Chinese are not like that. They actually have, you know, ideally, and this is for many years, many people in China prefer to pay things with cash. Um, you know, and again, if you, you know, now obviously because of the real estate price, uh, you know, have, have obviously has appreciated so much in the last 20 years, very difficult to buy a house in cash, you know, for many Chinese families. So now a mortgage is acceptable, but again, you're still going to be putting down a very large portion compared to, you know, what you are in the West. So again, that really does provide the banks a very good buffer. So that is some extra security there. Now, it's also unclear whether all these home buyers joining the boycott will really go through with their promise to stop paying in the coming months, or if they are simply making MP threats to put pressure on the government. The top concern for the government is the threat to social stability. So they have strong incentives to de-escalate the situation. So, you know, this is an interesting thing, you know, where home buyers have said, you know what, we're going to stop making mortgage payments. And what we've also seen from China's government there's another Bloomberg article. I don't have the link in me right now to pull up on the screen, but basically it said that Chinese banks are looking at potentially pausing mortgage payments, you know, for a period of, you know, maybe three to four months, you know, sacrificing the interest on that. Now that would be a very big, um, you know, step from China. And it's actually kind of, I would say it's some goodwill. You know, it's the Chinese government saying, look, we're going to, let's take a break. Let's take a break from, you know, charging these interest payments for a few months. Let's kind of settle the situation. And obviously the Chinese banks would take a huge loss. I mean, if they're not, 
if, if they're not taking interest payments, you know, for a period of three months, you know, over 100,000 projects, that's a lot of money. You know, that's a lot of money that they're not collecting. Um, but it is, I, I really like that last sentence there. And that's something that I often talk about when we discuss China is the fact that, you know, China's government, the number one goal for China's government is it has to ensure stability because with stability and economic progress, that justifies really, you know, the party's existence. And that is really one of the main concerns for the, for the party is making sure that they have that social stability. So I understand that uh, many people are concerned, you know, with these people making bank runs. And also one of the things that we also have to understand is that this is in a very rural part of China. So, you know, sometimes word spreads very fast. If one person says, hey, this bank's going to collapse, we need to get our money out you know, he's going to go tell everybody in that village the same thing. And it could kind of spread like wildfire. And this is why this is why China is very strict on certain things. You know, for example, um, you know, there's certain practices um, like even like these religious cults that exist in, you know, that exist. China doesn't want these cults in China because, you know, they know that it could spread very fast and it's very dangerous for the people, you know, so they want to make sure that these you know, crazy religious cults are not being spread. So you, it, you can see that. But I think what we're going to see right here is that kind of my conclusion on this bank matter is really, uh, we're going to, let me wrap this up, this about the banks. And then I actually haven't checked the comments. So let me check these comments afterwards because um, I've been on a roll here talking. I love chatting with you guys about this. But I think what we're going to see with China is, is that, you know, times of economic stress and, you know, sometimes mortgage problems, this happens in every country in the world. I mean, there, there's different times. And this is a, a this is definitely an issue that China is going to have to deal with. I do think that they are, are well prepared to deal with this. And they're going to take the right steps to make sure that the social stability is there. Um, again, you know, when we talked about the Evergrande situation, right, that was huge news about seven, eight months ago. Everybody thought Evergrande was going to collapse. And, you know, we what we saw is we saw local governments coming in. Um, you know, the central government was giving pressure to the local governments to take on some of those loans, reduce the debt. And the priority is, is that if, if a Chinese household has put a down payment on a residential project, well, we need to get that project built for them, you know, because they can't lose that money. Because if, if people are investing in products and, and then losing their entire life savings, you know, that's going to be cause a very big social uprising. And that's the last thing that the party wants to see. So again, it's in China's best interest to de-escalate this. I think, again, looking at, say, the banks taking a break for a few months, saying we're not going to charge these interest payments, we're going to be able to sort these things out. You know, let's give it some time. You know, I'm a bit more optimistic on that. But I do like that article from, from or that research from Plenum China, that they do a very good job, you know, breaking down and giving us a little bit more context. And so that's why, again, I think, you know, Western media, sometimes they do a very good job of scratching the surface they kind of report on what's happening, but to really understand how China works, you got to get down to the grassroots level. You have to you have to be speaking with people on the ground in China. Again, I'm going to trust a research firm that's investing in China, very active in China. Um, they're going to have the real insights to help us all better understand the reality of what's of what's really going on there. Um, everybody, we've got over 600 people now in the stream. So if you're just joining right now, thank you so much. My name is Cyrus Jansen. If this is your first time. Um, you know, uh, coming here to the live stream. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, we've got an important stream today. We're talking about two major issues is the one is going to be the bank and mortgage crisis. We've pretty much gone over everything I wanted to share on that. And then we're going to kind of open that up to some questions right now. In the second half of this, we're going to be talking about the Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and, you know, and her role, um, you know, she potentially is going to go to Taiwan. Uh, this is a very big very, very big situation in, in the United States, Taiwan, China relations. Um, she originally was going to go to Taiwan in April. She caught COVID. She's had to delay that. And I've got some interesting analysis I'm going to share on that as well. But first, let's go to the comment section and see what everybody's everybody's saying. And if you have any questions, and uh, any so if you have any questions, please let me know and drop that down below. And I'm going to just go to some uh, super chats as well. So we did have a super chat come in from um, I0807. Um, I think that's Singaporean dollar says thank you. So um, uh, I0807, thank you so much for the support to the channel. I uh, appreciate you guys uh, being here. Um, 
we got a question on here saying uh, cancel culture. You know, cancel culture is <laughs> very much alive. You know, uh, in in North America, it's it's a, it's quite fascinating all the things that are developing. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, seems like we have some uh, some trolling going on in the comment section. Alex, thanks for taking care of those. You know, we know that sometimes people like to come in here, um, you know, and do some. So Jim Chan, Cyrus is a good guy. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that comment. Uh, China is so huge. From Vicky, yeah, it is very huge. China is a very big country. And that's why it's also interesting. You know, um, one of the things that I've done is, you know, when you look at, um, even when you look at marketing in China and you look at how, you know, China, I always say this, China is more like a continent than it is a country because it's so diverse and it's it's almost like, for example, if you were to if you had a product and you wanted to market it to Europe, um, it's very difficult to say I'm going to market this to Europeans because Europe is so divided, right? I mean, you're going to need to market it to Germans, to French, to Italians, to Scandinavians, and even within Scandinavia, Norwegians, Sweden, um, Swedish people. You know, you need to. That's kind of how China is. Is if you look at the continent of Europe and how diverse it is. China is very similar. You know, Beijing is very different from Shanghai and Guangdong and out west when you go out to Chongqing, where my buddy Alex is at, you know, very different culture there. So even if you have a product and you're bringing that in, you know, you're going to have to understand culturally how things are going on in that local region. So, again, you know, this is a this is something that really people need to understand. Sometimes, especially in the West, we just think of China as one place and we think of China speaks one language, Chinese. Well, there's over 300 different dialects. I mean, there's you know, there's so many different, uh, you know, interesting cultural insights and language. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating country. That's why I think it's so, um, you know, so amazing. This is a good. Um, here we go. Um, this is from um, Hong Ta. The six officials have been arrested, whereas the savings and loans banking fiasco resulted in only one Chinese owned financial institution called Abacus being prosecuted for lodging false loan documents. Now, I think that's one thing that also needs to be discussed is with this banking crisis, that there was some fraudulent activity. And I think also what the Chinese government has done is they kind of shut down that local bank because there was a lot of fraud going on. And I think that was another issue is that many people, they weren't able to come into the bank and withdraw their money. But it's basically, you know what, we're going to freeze the assets in this bank. We're going to, you know, have our investigators look into this fraudulent activity. And in the meantime, you know, we're not going to be allowing other people to come in and withdraw money. So there's also a bit of time there where, you know, they're, you know, they realize there's some corruption, there's some fraudulent activity, and, you know, they need to make sure that that is, you know, taken care of. So that's also really important to, to know. Um, let's see. This is from uh, uh, Liang Zhuge. Um, do you know about the history of China mainland and Taiwan? Uh, that's a very good one. That's a very one that it's important to understand the history of Taiwan and China, you know, to understand kind of the, the, the significance of that issue today. And, and I've made quite a lot of videos about Taiwan. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's really, I fear that a lot of people, especially from our U.S. politicians, don't fully understand, you know, the whole context behind that. We'll get more into that later as we talk about Nancy Pelosi and her potential visit. Now, this is from Vicky, um, uh, Vicky uh, Nicolaitis. Cyrus is an honest person. I like to pay with cash. Maybe we're old fashioned. It takes time to save. Yeah, for sure. Um, I agree. China will never fail and will always be standing tall. China, like all of us, I think all of every country in the world has issues, right? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, China has things that they're dealing with. Um, there's a lot of problems that they're going to have, um, like every country, right? I mean, um, you know, as you know, as many of you guys know, I'm American. Um, you know, I've lived abroad for 15 years, living in China, living in Canada, living in America. I mean, I've never been to a country that doesn't have issues and problems that we're working on. So um, I think it's important to... to you know, just make sure that we're all improving. And I think one of the things that I really work on, especially on this channel, is trying to make sure that people understand we live in a global economy and that we all need each other. I think that's my message is trying to find ways to uh, to work to, together. Um, here we go. Let's go. Cyrus is on fire. Thanks for the comments there. Let me just go through these last comments. And um, yeah, very good. So let me know if you guys have any any more comments or anything. We've got over 700 people in the stream now. This is fantastic, guys. Thanks for joining me here on this Saturday. Um, as you can see, I've got a different backdrop than normal. I'm, I'm currently on the road. I'm traveling. 
and uh, I've got some exciting things in the pipeline. I'm going to tell you guys that. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit later on in the stream as we get going. Now, let's go ahead and talk about Nancy Pelosi. And, you know, Nancy Pelosi is a very interesting figure. You know, she's not very well liked in America, I would say. Uh, many people, you know, do not have a lot of faith in her. Many Americans are very frustrated with her and, and just kind of, you know, what she's done in her political career. Um, I wouldn't say that she's a very strong leader. And my big thing that I would ask, you know, is when we're pushing, um, you know, what is what is really the main purpose of Pelosi going to Taiwan? What is really the end goal here? Now, I'm going to bring up a, um, a series of tweets. And uh, this is from a, a Chinese, uh, this is from a China America scholar, um, a gentleman by the name of Ryan Haas. Now, uh, interesting to note, I actually met Ryan Haas uh, in person, uh, where both of us were invited to give a speech at Vanderbilt University. Uh, many of you um, might, if you've been following this channel for a long time, and you go back to about February or March, um, you're going to actually, let me drop the link to that. I'm going to drop a link to that in the show notes for you guys. Because what I did is I traveled from Vancouver, Canada, I traveled to Nashville, Tennessee, and I gave a, a keynote speech. And it was really neat because I was a, I was invited on stage with Ryan Haas, who has had a very fantastic uh, political career. He's worked for the State Department of the United States, and he actually was stationed in Beijing um, under the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, you know, working on China relations. So he was part of Barack Obama's uh, presidential crew, um, you know, and basically the China contingent. So he was working for the United States government at the American Embassy in Beijing. Um, you know, has a lot of great insights into, um, you know, into China. And I really liked him. We really hit it off very well. Um, he's He works at, for a think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, and what we were talking about was, let me just go right here to the comment section here. So this is the link to, go ahead and click this link that I put down in the comment section, guys, and you can watch that speech. Uh, this was a speech that I, um, that I uh, gave um Actually, hold on. Let me make sure I got the right one here. I think that's the right one. Did I get the right one? Sorry. So that one was, um, so that was what do Chinese students think of America? So these are some student, I think I dropped a link for the student interviews that I did. And then here's another link. I'm going to drop you two links then. I've got another one that you guys can watch as well. And... We're going to show show you here. So these are two. So this last link that I just dropped right in here, um, what that was, this was the speech that I gave. And essentially, at, when we went to Nashville, um, what we did is we talked about um, the difference between the United States and China's COVID response. And so, we, so Ryan and I, we both analyzed, you know, the United States response. We analyzed the positives and, and negatives. We analyzed China's response to COVID, the positives and negatives. And it was really interesting because... Um, you know, he, again, he had a lot of good insights. I'm going to share with you guys what his thoughts are on Nancy Pelosi's potential visit to Taiwan. And it's important because, again, Ryan works for a think tank in Washington, D.C. He's 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 been in China a long time. I really respect a lot of the work that he does. And I just want you guys to understand kind of the United States position on this. And then let's go ahead and analyze this. OK, so I'm going to this is 11 tweets. I'm going to share them all with you. And then let's go ahead and analyze them afterwards. So we're going to start with here. This is the first tweet. This is from, again, Ryan Haas. I expect Nancy Pelosi will proceed with the reported plans to visit Taiwan in August. Now, nobody, nobody can credibly argue Pelosi is soft in the face of, of PRC pressure. She has had a long and clear record on China. That said, there has been a debate in Washington over Pelosi's trip. Proponents of her visit argue that Taiwan merits U.S. support, and Pelosi shouldn't buckle to Beijing's pressure. Skeptics suggest the trip carries more risks than benefits. We'll stop there. Let's go. Let's analyze a little bit right here. So I think what we're seeing is, is what, the, what, what's the main goal here for the United States in this potential visit by Pelosi? Well, Taiwan has a, uh, sorry, Ch America has a very close relationship with Taiwan, as we know. Uh, you know, America and Taiwan are very close. Um, obviously, we sell a tremendous amount of arms to Taiwan. And unfortunately, that is a thing that is just, really dominates the United States economy is our military, the military industrial complex. You know, we do deals with countries and sell a tremendous amount of armed weapons. Taiwan, 
Um, they've purchased billions of dollars of weapons from the United States. That's why we're very close with Saudi Arabia. We get their oil. We sell them a tremendous amount of weapons. Um, you know, we do. I mean, look at the weapons that we've sold to Ukraine. I mean, this is a big business for America. Um, you know, and also, obviously, it goes beyond weapons, but there's a lot of, um, you know, business between Taiwan and America. So we know that America is very close to Taiwan. And so there's some pressure from the United States that, you know, that we need to go to Taiwan and just give them more support. Just make basically go to Taiwan and make sure that they know that we have their back. That's essentially what the proponents of this would be saying. And it's quite interesting because I think what you see on on in American politics is you see a wide spectrum of how people in America are viewing this Taiwan relationship. I shared this in an earlier video, Michael Pompeo, former secretary of state, who potentially could be making a run for president in 2024. That would be a disaster. I think it would be an absolute nightmare to have him as president. I don't think he will run, actually. Um, I made my prediction. I think it's actually going to be DeSantis, the governor from my home state of Florida. I think he's going to make a run for president from the Republican side. But Mike Pompeo, I mean, he's been a big advocate of the United States formally declaring Taiwan as a country and breaking away from, you know, the one China policy. Now, now he's on the extreme, right? Now, that, that was the far extreme uh, opinion of that. That would be a disaster, of course. Um, and there's no point to do that. And But that's what he wants to see. Now, this is, so again, that's what some people in America want. Usually the very, um, the very hawkish and the very um, aggressive right-wing Republicans kind of have that thought. I think more there's a lot more sensible voices, especially people that have had experience in China and really understand things. They understand the importance of you know recognizing Taiwan as part of China and that complicated relationship. You know, I mean, it's really really important. So let's go back and analyze these these comments here again. Um, now we're going on to tweet number three here. The risk is that Beijing feels its concerns over Taiwan are not being heard and that it may use Pelosi's visit as a basis to take physical actions to restore the credibility of its concerns. Beijing wants to stanch expanding U.S.-Taiwan contacts and grow security assistance. Now, given the unrelenting pressure Taiwan has come under from Beijing, the U.S. should find meaningful ways to show its support for Taiwan. Such steps should be undertaken with the goal of maximizing benefit while minimizing risk and harm, including towards Taiwan. Now, that's a really difficult thing to achieve. I mean, how do you how do you show support to Taiwan, you know, in the maximum amount of way, but also minimize the risk? That's a very difficult thing to try to do. I don't really understand, you know, how the U.S. is going to do that. Um, I don't think sending Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan would be one of those. That's that's really going to be an escalating thing, uh, especially the timing of this. Right. In August, you know, this is kind of leading up to again, we're entering a very. Uh, interesting political time, both in, in China and in, in the United States. Um, as many of you know, in China, in November, there will be the 20th Party Congress, and this will be where President Xi Jinping gets his official third term as president of China. Um, leading up to that, there's a lot of internal meetings. Um, I know that kind of the week that Pelosi would potentially be going to Taiwan, that's typically when China's leaders go on a retreat in China and do their meetings. So it's kind of, it's almost a, it's a very specific t reason why Pelosi wants to go at that time, you know, that, and, and of course, if, if, if Chinese leaders are in a private location doing their internal meetings, but now you've got Pelosi in Taiwan, that kind of throws things off. So the timing is really important here. Um, I mean, if Pelosi is going to go to Taiwan, it, it would be better if it's later in the year. I mean, that's, that's the reality. I mean, the August date doesn't seem to be ideal. So let's go ahead and keep analyzing these tweets and, and seeing um, what it says. Now, this is, I find number five really the most interesting one. As a matter of U.S. policy, America's abiding interest is to preserve peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. All decisions should be guided by this objective. Now, that's an interesting one. So if the United States goal is always to preserve peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, and this should be the founding principle that all decisions should be made on. Well, in my mind, if I was an advisor here, I would say, well, you know what? Sending to Pelosi to Taiwan in August, that's, that's not going to be achieving that goal. If that's really the cornerstone and really the, found, the fundamental basis for, you know, our, you know, dealing with Taiwan and the, and the peace and stability in Taiwanese Strait, I think it's really important that we, 
you know, that we understand sending Pelosi there is not going to achieve that goal. It, it was also a bit concerning as well because President Joe Biden, um, you know, he didn't really seem to understand a lot of what's going on there. You know, he had, he had said earlier, um, you know, my military advisors, you know, they've advised not to send Pelosi. Not really sure. We need to kind of look into that. Didn't really sound very confident that he actually knew the significance of what that Pelosi visit would mean and re really, again, the timing of this. So I think a guy like uh, Ryan Haas, who actually who lives in Washington, D.C., works for an American think tank, has had a tremendous amount of experience on the ground in China. You know, this is a credible voice that needs to have a little bit more uh, say in this because he can provide some context here. Um, and he does that. Let's let's continue. Now, given this, there may there may be value in reconsidering the timing of Pelosi's trip. If she travels in early August, she will elicit a maximalist PRC response that Taiwan will absorb. Timing is adjacent to the PLA day around the PRC leadership retreat to Bei Daihe and in the run up to the party congress. Now, this is exactly what I had mentioned earlier is the fact of the timing of this. Again, I don't know if this is the United States, like is, is Pelosi targeting this time, knowing that that's going to be a very important time for China's leaders. And that's a very pivotal time in China. Um, if you are, then you're not achieving that main goal of peace and stability in, in Taiwan and in the Taiwanese Strait. You're basically stirring the pot. You know, that's, that's the reality of the situation. So again, the timing is really important of this potential visit. So if we continue to read, um, given this, there, uh, yeah, so there may be value in reconsidering the timing of Pelosi's trip. Let's go on to number seven here. Uh, Chinese leaders likely will err on the side of overreaction if the trip proceeds in August. To do otherwise would be would be, be to risk being labeled weak at a sensitive moment. Later in the year, the party congress will be in, in the rear view, and there may be a transition underway in House leadership. Now, I don't think there's going to be any, um, um, I don't think there's any, real speculation that Xi Jinping will not get a third term. I think that's pretty much guaranteed. There has been a lot of rumors and kind of some mumbling that, hey, potentially, you know, there could be other people challenging Xi Jinping. There could be a lot of internal politics that are happening in the party that not a lot of us, ha you know, have an, obviously a knowledge of. I think what we're going to see is I think Xi Jinping will most definitely get his third term but potentially the people that are underneath him, you know, in the standing committee and some of the other important leaders in China, they might not be reelected. So maybe, you know, the cabinet and the people that Xi Jinping is dealing with, maybe those people are not going to be exactly who Xi Jinping wants. But we're going to see that with the 20th Party Congress here. Let's go ahead and finish up these this series of quotes uh, of tweets. We've got another four. Let's go to number eight here at the top. Pelosi could provide public support for Taiwan in August and pledge to visit at a future date. Uh, no matter what happens in the midterm, she will be the speaker until January 3rd. She could, she conceivably could visit as speaker at the end of the year. That timing would likely generate less heat. So I think that's, again, probably, again, I think that's where you have Ryan um, providing some better context here. Again, now obviously Ryan works for the United States government. Um, you know, he, you know, he's going um, to have a very pro-America uh, standpoint, which is, is totally understandable. Again, he has knowledge of how to work in China and understand if we're going to make this trip, let's be more sensitive, be a little bit more small. We do this, you know, potentially, again, he's going to be speaker through the end of the year. So there's no need to do it right now. If we are, let's go ahead and, you know, let's get through all the political meetings, both in the United States and in Taiwan. And, you know, then we can look at, this, you know, a potential year. These tweets. We're going to number nine. Uh, some will argue that the U.S. should not factor in the PRC response. Doing so will invite and embolden future PRC bullying, and the U.S. must protect its ability to have meaningful dialogue with Taiwan. I support preserving close U.S. Taiwan coordination. This is not a problem now. There are strong, active U.S. Taiwan channels across all elements of the relationship. There has been a high tempo of recent congressional engagement with Taiwan, a high level bipartisan delegation of former officials led by Admiral Mullen. Um, recently visited Taiwan. And let's go ahead and go to number 11, the final one. The stakes for a visit by the speaker are too high to be driven by the August congressional rec uh, recess calendar. Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. Speaker Pelosi could show support and at less risk later in the year than in early August. So again, this is, I think, some good insights from someone that is that is obviously going to be very pro-America and have that U.S. government viewpoint. But, you know, again, there's 
some things where, again, we have to really proceed with caution and just respect. When when you have, again, let's go to the extreme example here. When you have someone like um, Secretary, former Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo, you know, the reason that he says these comments is because, again, he, you also have to remember, um, he gets paid a tremendous amount of money for speaking engagements. I think he was paid around 300,000 US dollars to go to Taiwan. He basically did a 30 minute speech, flew first class, five star accommodation, um, you know, to come to Taiwan. And basically, just he got paid by a very pro Taiwan nationalist group to go and spew some nonsense that that most people with a rational mind in America, a guy like Ryan Haas, I mean, he's not going to agree with what Michael Pompeo is saying. Ryan Haas understands the complexities of managing this complicated relationship. Because again, you know, the United States does have a very good relationship with Taiwan. We have a good relationship with China as well. Uh, and what I've said, you know, this is what I mentioned in an earlier video, is that the U.S. and China, they are strategically tied at the hip for the foreseeable future. And I'm talking for a long time in the future. China owns trillions of dollars of U.S. debt. They cannot unload that debt anywhere. The United China will continue to hold that for decades to come. In addition, the United States is absolutely joined at the hip with China as far as all of our manufacturing and supply needs. We absolutely need China you know, for the economic development of America. And that is that is so important for people to understand. Uh, people don't realize, especially Americans, every time I come back to America, it's amazing how little people understand about how our world works, how the global economy works, and how, you know, why a strong China is also good for America. Because again, we live in this global world and this global economy. So it's really important to understand these. You know, when you have... You have to really question their motive. When somebody like Pompeo goes to Taiwan, gets paid $300,000 for 30 minutes of work, basically to just go up on stage and, and piss off China, I mean, there's really no point in doing that other than you're going to get a payday. That's that's the bottom line. Um, I mean, that's that's how he makes his money is he's going to go give these obnoxious talks and, and he's so, you know, hawkish against China. And somebody like that really doesn't bring any credibility to the table because, again, you know, you're you're living in this bubble where you think America is, you know, we're the best, we're the only, you know, and, and this is the same thing. I mean, I, I noticed this as well when, you know, you know, forget China. Let's talk about Canada. You know, um, you know, Michael Pompeo says the best strategy for the world is putting America first. And and I, and, I mean, I'm American. Obviously, I want America to do well, um, you know, but. Again, I don't agree with that. You know, living in Canada, for example, um, I want to see Canada make the best decision for for Canada. And there's certain things that um, that that I I don't like that they do. For example, you know, Canada was dragged into the um, uh, they weren't dragged into um, they were dragged into the war um, in Af I forget it was either I think it was Iraq or Afghanistan. One of the wars they decided not to partake in. Um, and, you know, typically Canada always has, you know, they're basically uh, an ally of the United States. They're going to follow the United States lead. And so I want to make sure I said, well, as Canadians, you know, you need to be doing the best for your country just because the United States is your largest trading partner. Um, you know, you need to step up and do the right thing for you. We saw this with the whole Meng Wanzhou situation. If you guys remember that, if you've been following the channel for a long time, um, you'll know that I, I mean, I covered that trial extensively. Why? Because I was on the ground in Vancouver talking about U.S.-China relations, you know, ironically, in a third party, in a third country, which was in Vancouver, Canada. Um, but again, you know, you know, Canada was put in a very awkward situation uh, because of the treaties. They had no other option but to arrest uh, Meng Wanzhou. But, the, but, you know, it was really, they were caught in a very awkward situation where many Canadians felt, hey, this isn't in our best interest. Why are we having to listen to the United States and do their dirty work? And that was one of the things that, um, you know, that was one of the things that um, when I went to the courthouse, off the record, I was speaking with the security guards outside the courthouse. And that's what they said. I mean, that was that was an off the record thing that they said. I'm not going to quote anybody on that. But, you know, just privately speaking to me, he said, you know, to be honest, like we're just doing the dirty work of the U.S. And we don't like it. You know, as Canadians, why do we why do we we don't want to have Meng Wanzhou in Canada? You know, now this is, you know, and you saw the, the spell out effects of that. Obviously, a lot of confrontation between Canada and China. And Canada has had a good relationship with with China. So again, you know, you always got to look at people's, you know, what's their intention here? 
And a guy like Secretary of State Michael Pompeo, uh, the interesting thing with him as well is you also have to remember, because he was so hawkish against China, he's been banned from China. He cannot, um, he cannot visit mainland China and he cannot do business with any company that does, with, that does business in China. So, you know, for example, many people, for many politicians, after he finishes his Secretary of State job, you know, he would be getting a, a very high profile consulting job at one of these publicly traded companies in America. Well, most publicly traded companies have access to the Chinese market. They do business with China. Well, China's not basically, you know, basically Michael Pompeo has been blacklisted. So there's a little bit of revenge there, I think, from Michael Pompeo, where he's he's bitter. You know, he's he's not happy that he's been, you know, basically blacklisted from doing business in China. So that's why he's taking these speaking engagements and pushing that, you know, that pushing that needle. But again, you know, we, we don't want to listen to guys like that because he's on the far extreme. You know, I think and that's the thing right now that's really difficult in America is that you have both sides. If you're on the very far extreme left or you're on the very far extreme right, you know, these are the people that are causing a lot of the problems in America because for the average American, they're a little bit more close to the middle. You're always going to have your Republicans and your Democrats, but it's the extreme sides of both that are really the, uh, the culprits for the chaos that we're seeing right now. And so again, you know, I like to bring it back to the middle and we need to understand the importance of, you know, Taiwan, China, the United States. And the United States has a very interesting relationship because we do do a lot of trade with Taiwan and we're trying to basically balance a relationship where officially the United States does recognize the one China policy. The United States government recognizes that Taiwan is part of China. There's no doubt about that. You can ask any government official. I will ask the president of the United States, ask any government official, they, they, that is the policy of the U.S. government. And, you know, and within that, you know, we do have certain agreements and arrangements with Taiwan to have, you know, you know, for example, to still sell them arms and do other things. So it's a very complicated relationship that just needs a lot of knowledge and a lot of nuance and really a lot of experience to understand. So... I, I like those tweets from Ryan Haas because basically you have someone within that's close to Washington, D.C. saying, hey, guys, guess what? August is not going to be the best time for this. If the goal is to strategically de-escalate the situation and make sure that we have as much peace and stability in that region, then delaying Pelosi's visit would definitely be the best thing. Um, and so um, and I had shared in a tweet earlier as well that, you know, I don't even know if it's really beneficial, you know, to, you know, what really is the point of Pelosi going there? Um, so anyways, let's go ahead and turn it over to the comment section here um, and see what you guys have been writing. When I get on a tangent here, I just go, I'm looking at the camera. I'm not looking at the comments. So I'll go back here, but we've passed over 1100 people in the stream here, which is amazing. Uh, really, really awesome. I want to thank you guys for uh, being here today. You know, it's been a while since we have, um, you know, done a stream, but again, I'm, I, I want to, I'll tell you guys a little bit more as we close out the stream of what my plans are for the future and how we're going to keep growing this channel and uh, doing these things. So let me go scroll back up and uh, see if we missed some good comments. All right. Got a very active comment section here. I need to um, go back in here. Oh, man. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, from Liang Juga, Cyrus is an excellent speaker. I appreciate appreciate the the support here. Um, Cyrus's program is a waste, as many Americans are not given the chance to listen. Well, that's something that I want to do is, is spend more time uh, back in America and actually speaking with um, you know with more American citizens and and really you know trying to make an inf make a more of an influence in my home country. You know, the interesting thing is. Um, you know, many people, many people ask me, you know, Cyrus, you know, when you, I want to share with everybody something that I've learned that's very interesting. Whenever I travel back to America, I, I spend a lot of time talking to people. And, you know, many people, you know, obviously one of the most common questions is, hey, what do you do? You know, what, what do you do for a living? Things like that. And, you know, I always say, well, I, I help build bridges between the United States and China. And that's, that's how, that's, that's what, um, that's what I always lead with. Now, that's a very, interesting answer. So a lot of people are like, oh, what does that mean? You know, what do you do? You build bridges. What do you mean you build the U.S.-China relationship? And what I found is, is I found that the more established, more affluent, more wealthy 
you individuals that you find in America, usually the more smart they are to this global economy that we live in, and they understand how important the U.S.-China relationship is. I've actually found, and from my personal experience, from everywhere, from meeting people at the airport, to meeting people at restaurants, to just simply talking to people on the streets, I found that most Americans, you know, when I get a chance to talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, they're actually very curious to learn about China. And I've had, I mean, I get so many emails every day from from people all over the world, you know, saying, hey, I've been really curious to learn about China. I appreciate your channel. You know, I appreciate your ability, your your desire to really improve the relationship. And, you know, I'm really thankful for the work that you do. So the comments like that are amazing for me because it's a great motivation. But again, my main point is, is that I've, I've, you know, as I travel to throughout North America and U.S. and Canada, I found most people are very open uh, to, to, you know, dealing with China, learning more about China. And you have to understand is that, you know, in America, you know, there's a lot of people that are, I think, I think America is unique in the sense that it's a very localized country um, in the sense that if you're from Florida, you typically really only pay attention to things that are happening in Florida. And you don't really know what's even happening outside of your state. Um, you know, what's happening in California, nobody knows what that in Florida, right? And so, you know, as a result of that, if you, you can imagine that if you're in Florida and you only know what's happening in Florida, you don't even know what's happening in other states, well, you definitely don't know anything that's happening in, in Europe or Australia or even, and especially a country like China. So, so that's where the problem really lies is the fact that, you know, and this is why still in 2022, so many Americans, you know, they just think of China as, oh, it's just this communist country. Oh, it's, you know, it's a poor country, third world country, bicycles, Chairman Mao suits. I mean, that was really the perception 15 years ago when I first went to China. Ironically, I mean, still 15 years later, 2022, many people still have that same perception that China is a very poor country and they just don't have that knowledge. And again, you wouldn't have that knowledge unless you're specifically going out there and seeking that information. Unless, you know, but again, if, you're, if your whole world is in Florida, why would you be interested to go on to YouTube and say, you know, what's really happening with the bank situation in China? Um, you know, and that's where, that's where you kind of get in this caught, that's where you get caught where Americans, you know, Bloomberg says, well, you know, all of these mortgages are defaulting in China. Chinese people aren't going to pay their mortgages. The entire financial system is going to collapse. Well, there's a really good article that I shared earlier in today's stream from a research group that says, hey, this is the situation in China, even if it 10x from here, if all of these problems 10x, it still would have very little effect on the banking system in China for these reasons. Number one, all of them pay a huge deposit that gives the banks a huge buffer. Number two, just the population and the amount of people and projects that are going on. 100,000 households is relatively small in China. 100,000 households, well, that's going to probably, you know, uh, decimate a, you know, a, a project, you know, a city in America, because that's a tremendous amount of people. So it's a, a lot of it is the scale and just understanding that, that context between the two. Um, yeah, here we go. Eight out of 10 in the USA can't point out where USA is on a map. I, I would imagine, uh, I think most people in America would be able, hopefully they'll be able to, um, you know, point out America on a map, but they would, they'd, just, they'd struggle with other ones as well. Uh, will Nancy really go to Taiwan? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think we're we're. I would I would hope that that sensible people like Ryan Haas that has this insight into the you know Taiwan. I would hope that he has some leverage and and I think that you have to remember as well is that you know Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi. There's a lot more strategic people behind these people that, behind them that know about complex situations like Taiwan and 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 really understand this. You know, when you're elected to president of the United States, you might not have any knowledge of China. So what do you do? You hire the best or you employ the best advisors that really have that experience. You know, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I'm sure that there are people that are fluent in Mandarin that have extensive experience in China, you know, on, you know, as advisors to the president, you know, well, at least I hope so, because that's, I mean, if you don't have that, you know, that's a tremendous amount of uh, waste of resources. So, you know, they really, they really need to, um, you know, do that. So again, I think, I think, um, again, if we go back to that principle, if maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwanese Strait is the number one goal of the United States, I think they will reconsider and, and hopefully Pelosi can just say, you know what, 
I'm going to publicly support Taiwan simply in the sense that, you know, the U.S. and Taiwan has a close relationship. And then, you know, we're going to explore the option to potentially go for a visit later in the year. And I think that would be the best case scenario, you know, if there's going to be a visit from uh, Pelosi. Um, how can anyone deny that Taiwan is part of China when more than 180 countries in the United Nations approved? Very true. Um, you know, it is it is a very important thing. I mean, that's something that a lot of people don't know the history of that, right? I mean, this was the interesting thing before is that pre-1972, Taiwan was recognized as the government of China. And so basically, Taiwan uh, was recognized in the UN and they oversaw, um, you know, basically they they had the seat at the table in the UN and they dictated what was happening in mainland China. Well, in 1972, the United Nations said, well, no, it's actually China, mainland China and, you know, the Communist Party, that is the official government of, of China. And, you know, we do rule that Taiwan is part of China. And this is also an interesting thing that I've noticed as well, is that when you go back and you look at the history, Chiang Kai-shek, who is the, you know, the founder of Taiwan and the first president of Taiwan, he was all about um, a one China. You know, Chiang Kai-shek would never left, um, you know, mainland China to form his own country. What Chiang Kai-shek wanted is he had a different form of government. I think the better question that you can ask is, you know, who's the legitimate government of China? Because people like Chiang Kai-shek would say, well, it's our government. We rule all of China, which includes mainland China. Whereas obviously mainland China says, well, no, it's the Communist Party that rules all of China, including Taiwan. So I think you, the, the better question is, which is the government that rules, not is Taiwan part of China? Because even, you know, Chiang Kai-shek, you know, he firmly believed in one China. Now, the interesting thing is, is basically Chiang Kai-shek's kind of been canceled in Taiwan. Even as the first president, you know, you know, they're they're not pushing his narrative anymore. And actually in mainland China, they're actually promoting that more because mainland China is saying, hey, look, even Chiang Kai-shek said it's one China. Meanwhile, in Taiwan, they're saying, you know what, we don't want to teach that as much anymore. You know, let's kind of forget about Chiang Kai-shek because he did believe in one China. You know, let's promote something else. So, again, you got to learn that history and really understand that context. Um, sorry to interrupt. It seems like Daniel Dumrell has been very quiet and there's no video from him for the past few months. Hope he is safe. Um, I do know a little bit about Daniel. I know that he has been working on some, some things. Um, I'm not at liberty to say what they are. Um, but I will say that he is safe and um, also expect some things from Daniel. That's all I'm going to say. You know, I, I'm, I do have an insight, but I'm not at liberty to say, but he is safe. If you are worried about his safety, he's fine. Um, he um, like I'm, he's a very busy father as well. Um, I think he has I believe he has five children. I have three myself. So we, we're both very busy, um, uh, you know, uh, busy. Oh, I see we got a bit of lagging here. Yeah, I'm on the road here. Hopefully you guys are well, I still see 1200 people on the stream here, which is amazing, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And um, let's see. Pelosi has no more stocks to buy, has to pass the time. That's funny, David Lee. Um, here we go. Let's see what else we have here. Um, why are all the foreigners leaving China? Um, you know, that's a good question. Why are the foreigners leaving China? Well, I, I do think that, you know, the lockdowns in Shanghai was was a very big factor in that. Um, you know, I do know, um, as many of you know, I used to live in Shanghai for over seven years. Um, that was an amazing period of time in my life. I really loved my time in Shanghai. I have many, my best friend in the world, he still lives in Shanghai. He's a business owner, um, has a great business there in Shanghai. And, you know, he has seen a lot of his friends, a lot of his employees. Well, you know, a lot of people have left China. And I think it is, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I do think that, that uh, you know, that zero COVID policy is providing, it, it is proving to be very stressful for many foreigners. Um, and and it, it has been a long time. That's one thing that you have to remember is just the inability to to um, to go back home and see your family and, and you know, the uncertainty with, with uh, um, you know, getting in and out of the country is very difficult. Uh, one of my other really close friends, he lives in Shenzhen. He's a Canadian national. Um, his wife is Chinese. He has two daughters in China. And he has been wanting to go back to Canada for a visit to visit his parents. Unfortunately, he's been kind of at stuck there because he's like, well, I, I know if I leave, I'm not, I'm not necessarily able to get back in the country. And it's difficult because, you know, I want to see my parents, but I don't want to be separated from my wife and children. And, you know, I don't want to bring the wife and children as well in the case that we all get stuck. 
So he's essentially, he's been in China for three years straight, unable to really go back home. Now he's been in China for 15 years and he's in the process of applying for permanent residency. Now, once you are a permanent resident in China, uh, you know, then he'll have that ability to, you know, go in and out of China, no problem. You know, he'll always be able to go back into the country. But that's the one thing that he had told me recently, you know, I want to make sure I get my PR uh, that way I can, you know, enter freely into China. So it is a bit harder, for example, if you're on a two-year employment contract and, you know, the deal is, hey, you can't leave the country for two years. That's that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, I can even speak from experience uh, living in Canada during the pandemic. I, I found it very uneasy that I wasn't able to go back to my home country because of these COVID restrictions, just in the sense that, you know, my parents are older. I just thought, man, what happens if I get a phone call one day and there's a family emergency and I, I can't get back home. That was a very uneasy feeling for me. Um, you know, I, I think that ability to always travel and, you know, knowing that I can just jump on a plane if needed, um, that's going to be a big hindrance for many foreigners. I think we just need to be realistic about that. Um, now, obviously, if your wife is Chinese and you have your children with you in China, it's a little bit less uh, of a problem for you. But for many foreigners, that's not the situation. Um here we go. Did you know that all the delegation that visit Taiwan are paid by Taiwanese tax money, including all the expenses, a free vacation? Um, I did. I, I do know that. I mean, that's again, we, I mentioned with Pompeo. I mean, he got a very big payday to go to Taiwan. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 too. Uh, Cyrus, there's too many bots in the chat. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I don't control bots or anything like that. So a lot of people claim bots on Twitter and things. I mean, all I can do is just start streaming and connect with you guys. So um, it's out of my control. Um, here we go. Let's just go down. So let's uh, go ahead and wrap things up. We've got uh, we've just been streaming for over an hour now. So this is fantastic. Over 1,200 people here. Um, and I want to thank you all. So Guys, uh, let me know. We're going to wrap this up in about five minutes. And I'm going to tell you some of the future projects that I got going on right now. And then we're also going to um, tell you some of the things that are for the future of this channel. But any last questions that you had, um, drop them down in the comments. We'll answer those as we finish out. And again, thank you so much. Um, why, is, why is China supporting Russia? Um, that's a good question. Let's go ahead and answer that. Um, I think that there is, there's two things that I think what China is trying to do. Number one, um, you know, China is trying to balance a very tight rope relationship between Ukraine and Russia. You know, Taiwan, sorry, not Taiwan, uh, China has had uh, diplomatic relations with Ukraine for over 30 years. Uh, they celebrated that last year as a fact. And, you know, and China does recognize Ukraine as a sovereign nation. Uh, that's very important to understand. Because, you know, in, in addition to that, you know, China is also a strategic ally of Russia. And obviously their economies are very close. You know, they do a lot of partnerships and deals. Um, I think what China is basically trying to do is they're trying to manage that relationship. They're trying to show support to Ukraine. They're trying to support, show support to Russia and trying to stay neutral as best as they can. But I think for many Chinese, I think that many mainland Chinese will be very supportive of Russia in this conflict, mainly in the sense that I think out of self-preservation, and this is my theory on this, is the sense that, you know, if Russia were to, to, to collapse and if Vladimir Putin were to be defeated and if, you know, and if the West got a hold of Russia, I think there's a lot of fear that potentially China could be the next target. And so I think, you know, when you look at Russia, you know, many people are saying, well, if, if Russia survives and Putin survives and you know, they can win this war that, you know, that's maybe better for long-term stability of China in the long term as well. So I think it's actually more of a, their own self-interest for many Chinese saying, look, you know, I, I want to support Russia and I want, you know, I, you know, I think that's, that's at least my theory on that. Um, you know, but I think it's, it's also important to know, uh, I mean, uh, you know, for example, you know, most Chinese are not going to be very favorable of NATO. Um, obviously, NATO, a very Western organization that is that is geared, you know, it was founded to to combat the rise of the Soviet Union. You can make the argument that once the Soviet Union collapsed, NATO should have been dissolved. But we've seen NATO expand and expand. And I think you do see a lot of Chinese nationals recognize that the United States and NATO expansion has played a significant role in this escalation and this eventual war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so I think that's that's where, you know, you're going to see a bit more support in that regard. And, you know, that's that's my opinion on the matter. Um, da -da -da. 
Looks like everybody has a lot of comments in here where they uh, <laughs> where they they like to uh, you know you guys are have good chats among themselves. Um, yeah, Taiwan dare not officially declare independence as part of China. I don't think they do. I mean, the interesting thing is I've been to Taiwan many times before, and you know one of the things that was interesting is I saw the Economist. You know, they had a article, they had a headline article earlier last year, I believe it was Taiwan, the most dangerous place in the world. And it's a bit misleading because I think, you know, I saw a video clip that was really good where, you know, they they went to the streets of Taiwan and they were talking to local Taiwanese. And if you've been to Taiwan, you know, Taiwanese people are very friendly. Um, it's a very slow paced life. You know, I, when I used to live in Shanghai, I would go to Taiwan uh, for business and also I went for holiday as well. It was always really relaxing because when, even when you go to Taipei, which is the biggest city by far, it's very slow paced. It's, 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 it's like kind of going back in time. It's modern in some of the areas, but it's, you know, it's very old school. And I, and I think that, um, you know, many people there are very, it's a very slow pace of life. Uh, many people just enjoy eating. That's obviously the big thing to do when you go to Taiwan. But most people are like, hey, you know, we're just living our life. You know, we've heard of this kind of threat from China for a long time. You know, we basically just want to, you know, we're just going to go out and do our life. So they, they talked to a guy that was making noodles in the restaurant. And it's like, the economist just said you're the most dangerous place in the world. What do you think of this? And he's like, eh, that's OK. I'm just going to going to keep making my noodles, keep living my life. You know what? It is what it is. And, you know, the other interesting thing is that, that we have, we see so many Taiwanese actually go to China and work. And, and that was the interesting thing as well. Every time I went to Taiwan, people were like, oh, where are you visiting from? From, from Shanghai. Oh, man, Shanghai is amazing. So fast paced, so modern. So the infrastructure is amazing. What the Chinese government is doing there, it's unbelievable how fast it's developed. You know, you come to Taiwan, the economy is pretty stagnant. Um, you know, it's, you know, we haven't seen that huge increase in you know, in the infrastructure, you know, again, like going to Taiwan is kind of going back in history. It's a, it's a lot more underdeveloped. It's a beautiful place. I absolutely love Taiwan. I love the people. Um, I love the type of the, the Mandarin dialect that they speak there. I think it's fantastic. Um, and it's, um, it's really, really good. So um, anyways, guys, um, let's go ahead and wrap things up here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of the projects that we're going to be doing uh, in the future. Now, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be building a uh, kind of an indoor studio. I'm actually going to be renting an office space and building more of a permanent setup where I'm going to be doing more live streams like this. I mean, we have 1,200 people in the stream here. Uh, this is a stream I set up about, I think I set this up last night. And then, you know, we, to get 1,200 people in here uh, the next day, that's awesome. I really appreciate all of your support here and, and being here. That's really, really awesome. And what I want to do is I want to have a little bit more of a consistent live stream schedule. Um, I do like the live stream because typically what I do on a weekly basis is I'm, I'm constantly going through articles. I'm going through a lot of research and, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of time for me to do my videos because I do a lot of research and a lot of planning and scripting to make sure that these videos are very well put together. The live stream allows me to kind of analyze things on the go. As you saw in today, how I brought up articles, I brought up tweets and I said, hey, let's read these tweets out loud together. Let's dissect them. Let's add some nuance. Let's talk about it. It's kind of a good format for me. So I'd like to be doing this um, in a more regular uh, fashion. You know, hopefully having a solo live stream once a week. You know, for you guys um, starting in August um, as I as I get things wrapped up. Now, in addition to that, um, I'm going to be looking to do a collaboration with, with some other YouTubers. I won't mention their names, but you know. Um, I have some exciting things in the pipeline where we're going to be looking to be bringing a regular show, uh, bringing in multiple YouTubers, and also bringing in some good potential guests that have that have experience on the ground in China. Um, I, many of you had asked, for example, Pascal Coppins. Um, you know, he he runs a China channel called uh, Pascal's Lens on China, and he recently just authored his second book, which is called Can We Trust China? If you haven't had a chance to watch those episodes with Pascal. I encourage you to go to my videos right now and you can go ahead and, and uh, actually, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and drop that link there because I know you guys, um, you know, are probably interested in that. So this one is called, I asked a 30 year China expert if we can trust China. His answer was incredible. Now, this is the link to that. So if you haven't watched that, go ahead and, and uh, make sure you click that, watch that video. 
it's a really good and in, interesting insight. Now, Pascal has, has he's been traveling and doing business and he's had exposure to China for over 30 years. I learned a lot from this conversation. He asked a lot of really good questions. And this is part one. There's a link in there for part two as well. But what I really liked is, is that he he really uh, he tries to analyze things from both the Western and the Eastern perspective. And that's something that sometimes not a lot of people do. You know, you know, typically from Americans, we look at China from only the American lens. But what about China? They deserve a seat at the table. They deserve to have, you know, the Chinese perspective as well. And really to understand these complex situations, you need to have both the China and American lens or the China and Western lens, if you will. And that's what Pascal does really well in this book. So again, we're going to be bringing on guests like this and more of more and more live stream settings because live stream is fun. It's more interactive and it's really uh, entertaining for everybody. So we're going to be bringing in that and again, um, you know, bringing more regular content here. So I'm kind of in a bit of a transition right now um, as far as getting things set up for this new office space and really trying to take the channel to the next level. And so um, I, that's that's why actually this week I didn't have a video prepared for you. I had so many things going on. I, I just I'm on a business trip right now. I didn't have a chance to uh, you know, be able to have enough time to put a good quality video together. But I know that you guys want to see at least one video a week from me. So I said, you know what, let's make sure we do a live stream to make sure that we can connect with the fans, keep things going. So I'm going to wrap it up with there. Um, and again, any final questions, let me know. Uh, Mansana, you said Cyrus has done some videos with Sean Ryan. I have. I uh, did a two-part series we talked about. Um, Sean had a really good, interesting insight where he had debated. I think The Economist had, had, um, had invited Sean Ryan and Joshua Wong, um, you know, the, the, who was leading the protests in Hong Kong. Uh, both of them debated uh, on stage. And so I, I said, all right, Sean, share me your insights into Hong Kong. And then also share me your insights into Tibet and Xinjiang, because I get a lot of people requesting me to make videos on Xinjiang. I'm, very, I'm a bit reluctant to make videos on Xinjiang, mainly because I've never been there. And so I'd rather invite people that have been there and have had experience on the ground. You know, it's like, share me what, what, what you learned. You know, what did you learn from Xinjiang? What did you see? And so, you know, that was a good interview that we did with Sean Ryan. Uh, both of those were well received as well. So, guys, thank you. I know. Um, um, here we go. Uh, can you collaborate with Catherine's journey to the east? I think that would be very good. Um, speak a little bit of Cantonese. Oh, how you got whole tone ola music? Yeah, yeah. That's about it. <laughs> I'm really hungry. <laughs> um, so, uh, anyways, guys, thank you. Amazing for your incredible support. Um, I look forward to doing more live streams, more content for you guys. Um, drop some more comments in this video. Let me know what you think. And again, thank you all for your time. And we look forward to seeing you in a future video soon. Take care, guys. Where's my video clips?